Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Hope that your morning is going well and whatever you're doing, that God has already just wrapped his loving kind arms around you and already have shown you his grace, his mercy, and his love. But I wanted to talk about, do men cheat more often than women? Do men cheat more often than women? And I encourage you to leave your comments in the, in the comment box below after this video. Well, when most people hear the word cheater, they picture a man in their head. You know, men and women are both capable of having an affair. We know that. But men are roped into the stereotype a lot more than women. You know, a lot more often than women, men are roped into this stereotype that they cheat. That as soon as they see a woman that might, you know, uh, look better than them or, you know, than the other woman or their wife, it's like an automatic that they're going to look at that woman and desire or, you know, flirtatious and, you know, they're going to have these ideas. But, you know, I think about that and I, I beg the question of do men cheat more than women? That's that's the question, though. Do men cheat more than women? Is there really some merit to this long accepted myth? Because you can go back and you can look at paternity court and you can look at the Marvy Povich show and all these shows about paternity. And it appears that women tend to, uh, cheat more than men because a lot of times women don't know who the father of their children are on these shows. And then when it comes out, he is not the father according to DNA. So that's why it's good to, to do your research and to find out, do men really cheat more than women? Now, yes, there are women that cheat a lot. And when they don't know who the father of their child is, then you know that they've had other relationships with other men. And this is not to bash any women. So please don't take it that way. This is real talk. But we're talking about the question is, do men cheat more than women? Well, infidelity statistics, and this is coming from the Journal of Marital and Family Therapy uh, on Perspective softroy.com. And so that's the, um, the, the site Ch journal of marital and family therapy, and it's the infidelity statistics on cheating men versus cheating women. Now, um, it says that 57%, according to the journal of marital and family therapy, 57% of men overall admit to committing infidelity at some point in their lives. Admit. Now, how many men have not admitted it? So the statistics could be higher if more men admitted to it. And even for women, 54% of women overall admit to committing infidelity in one or more of their relationships. So if women are not being 100 and if women admit it more, their, their statistics, the percentage will be higher also. So you're looking at basically a 3% between men and men and women of the overall admission, admission. This is not saying people that have not admitted to the cheating that possibly have cheated, but will not admit to it because they don't want to look bad. They don't want nobody to know they're capable of doing something so sinful as a lot of people look at it as sinful are just downright bad and ashamed and they don't want their their character blemished or have that blemish on their character but the blemish is already there if you've already cheated because God knows when you cheat but you don't want the public or your friends or family to know you cheated so you you have a blemish but you don't want other people to know about that blemish so it says an overall admission so 57% of men overall admit to committing infidelity at some point in their lives and 54% of women overall admit to committing infidelity in one or more of their relationships. Now, 22% of married men admit to having an affair at least once during their marriages and 14% of married women admit to having an affair at least once during their marriages. Now, the 22 and 14% is a bigger gap than the 57 through the to the 54 percent but however the percentages of men and women 
who have cheated in a relationship are very similar, as you can see from these uh, statistics that I've provided to you. But however, however, when you look at uh, the, some of the married couples, the lives of married couples, men do have a higher rate of infidelity than women. But these numbers, like I said, may be skewed based on the amount. And they can be skewed based on the amount of people who are willing, who are willing, like I said, to admit to it, who are willing to tell the truth about their, you know, their indiscretions, their infidelity. But um, can we say it's safe as a whole? Well, we can say that both genders have the ability to cheat on one another. Like I was saying, when I gave you some examples of paternity court where, you know, you see a lot of women not knowing who the father of their child is. Uh, and so that's an example there. Or the man has many baby mothers. That's an example right there. And he's supposed to be with, in a, in a, excuse me, in an exclusive relationship, but he's with uh, you know, messing around with other women. So we see that a lot that goes on today. Now, what really is classified as cheating? Well, um, you know, we can look at a lot of different things about cheating because there's different forms. You know, cheating comes in different forms. Uh, most people associate the term, you know, cheating with like a physical act of infidelity, like sex, you know, you know, sex is what usually people will consider cheating. When you first think of the word cheating, what do you think of? Do you think of sex, you know, outside of marriage, outside of a monographer's relationship? What do you think of cheating? Well, it also can be emotional cheating. It can be involved where um, you're sharing your deepest personal uh, private thoughts with someone other than your spouse. Um, it could be breaking a fundamental bond that kept the marriage together. Uh, it can be you texting, you know, sexual texts, you know, um, it doesn't have to always be physical, but if you, but the violation can still be just as strong as a physical contact. So whether you physically interact with another person or you just give yourself over to them mentally or emotionally, you can still do tremendous damage by straying from the relationship. And that's what I was just saying is that you can still, you know, it can still be detrimental. You could be, hurt, you know, it can hurt, you know, even to, to break the bond and be talking about personal things that you feel your spouse or your, your partner that you've been with, you only share with each other and you go out and share these things with someone else. It can be a form of cheating. Now, is there, um, is there hope? Is there hope in your relationship for the future after uh, a spouse or a significant other have cheated? Is there hope? Well, you can go to couples counseling after an affair has happened. Uh, you can go to your pastor, you know, with and for counseling and someone that really believes in the uh, holy matrimony and they're not biased. See, that's another thing too, is to make sure that when, if you are going to seek counseling after an affair has occurred in the marriage, in the relationship, make sure that the counselor is not biased because I was talking with someone, uh, months ago and they shared a lot with me about their marriage. And they, uh, she told me that the pastor that she was getting counseling from was leaning towards more on the man side. And this was a male pastor, but he leaned more on the husband side, the male side versus, uh, being, uh, unbiased and neutral, but still being able to bring them back together. Um, you know, on one accord. And I just by her conversation and what she was sharing with me, I knew right away that that pastor was biased and I felt that he was not operating from a biblical perspective when it comes to marriage, because some of the things she shared with me, it wasn't coming from a biblical perspective. And one of the things I will say that, uh, is that as long as he paying the bills and you have a roof over your head, 
uh, you know, it's all right. See, that's not all right. And so I knew that he wasn't coming from a biblical perspective because there's a lot of things that will break down a marriage and a lot of things that will break down a relationship. And if people think that just having a house and a roof over your head and money in the bank is the only reason you should stay married and be happy, those are a lot of reasons why people are not happy and they stray because the love of money is the root of all evil. And if your money is not aligned with the statutes and biblical principles of the word of God, a lot of times there's no joy because money cannot, it, it can't buy joy. You know, maybe contemporary fulfillment or they say contemporary happiness, but it cannot buy that joy that is not determined by your circumstances. See, I'd rather have joy than to have money and hate, money and not be loved, money and contention and confusion and strife. I would not want that type of money. I'd rather have joy. See, I don't want money to take over my dignity and my integrity and my love for Christ. So when people say you ought to be happy, whether you're a husband or wife, you ought to be happy in your marriage because this is what you have. Well, you can be thankful for what you don't have and be happy. You can be thankful for what you don't have and have joy. You can be thankful and live your life without none of the things that this pastor was sharing with her because she said, I don't have to stay, but I want to please God. But in pleasing God, you got to look at the biblical principles when you're talking about pleasing God and really understand what pleasing God means. Now, um, this person wasn't someone that, that could not live on their own. But in that relationship, one of the things that stuck out to me that she shared with me is that the spouse was sabotaging her relationship with Christ. He was speaking spiritual death on her relationship with Christ. And it was dis discouraging her and putting her down for wanting to continue teaching Bible study and, and because she was not happy and things weren't right and she felt emotionally abused, he was actually holding that against her and was speaking spiritual death on her relationship with Christ. And one of the things about that is that's harmful in a marriage. And that is grounds to seek counseling. And that's one of the things about being, staying in a marriage uh, or leaving it, adultery and spiritual death. See, we should speak spiritual life over other people's lives, not spiritual death. And in the Bible, if you, you know, in, in doing some deeper study and spiritual death can be a reason that a spouse leaves their, their spouse. It can be. Um, in deeper studies, you can find that. And I, I studied that and, 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 uh, it's one of the reasons that you can leave. I'm not saying divorce or, but to leave, to get some healing and to come back together renewed. And so this pastor really wasn't speaking about that. He was just speaking about the monetary or the, 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 the material aspect of the marriage. And again, a spiritual, I mean, excuse me. And again, uh, material things and monetary things in a broken relationship is very difficult to continue in that relationship. It's hard. It's emotionally draining. And so when you seek whoever you are that may need to seek counseling in your marriage after an affair, 
and what led up to the affair. Because I'm also talking about things that led up to an affair. There are some things that lead up to affairs as well. And with that being said, thinking about that on what things that lead up to an affair and things that you're not getting fulfilled in your relationship and just unbelief in the relationship alone. And sometimes couples are unequally yoked. And that's another thing. When couples are unequally yoked from the very beginning, or you find out you're unequally yoked afterwards. And so that's difficult too. Um, marrying someone that's not saved, but you are, you know, or you believe in the biblical, the Bible, the biblical standards, principles, concepts, statutes, uh, you know, and your spouse doesn't, and they don't never go to church, but you do, you know, there's a lot of different reasons that causes couples to be unequally yoked. And sometimes couples just can never come to a consensus or a resolution. And it causes the marriage to, to dissolve a dissolution of marriage instead of resolution for the marriage. And so with that being said, I hope that I'm able to reach somebody today and hope that you can rebuild your relationship if that's your desire. But it has to be the desire of both people in that relationship, both people. And we have to take a look at ourselves and examine ourselves and stop pointing fingers and sit down. And if we say we love one another to show love and kindness and mercy and consideration for what transpired in the relationship. And if you both can do that and come to a consensus, maybe you can rebuild it. And if you can't come to that consensus, then, you know, it's really difficult a lot of times to rebuild, but prayer changes things. And so you got to keep your prayer requests before the Lord, even if you don't manage to rebuild the relationship or the marriage. And I'm not promoting divorce, but I'm just saying we are talking realistic and social issues. And so even if that you don't, it doesn't happen that way, but to be able to walk away uh, mutually, you know, cordially and not with anger and hate and discontent and wanting to, to harm someone in a manner because we see so many killings today. Even I just saw an article about this man uh, was rejected before touching a woman in, 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 you know, uh, inappropriately. And she, uh, you know, she slapped him or hit him and he, he, he shot her, he killed her, you know, shot her in the stomach. And that's wrong. You know, that's disheartening. It's grievous, you know? Um, so with that being said, with that being said, um, you know, I invite you to consider peace. I invite you to consider love to consider mercy, to consider harmony, and to consider unity, to join in in the good things of Jesus Christ and to celebrate his love on today in this season and to consult your Bibles and to, to, to consult with friends that believe in, the, in, in Jesus Christ and his word and to come together to study the word and, and to share Christ to share the gospel with someone else because we never know who's going through it. We never know what someone has suffered. We cannot tell somebody else's story, you know, and that's the thing. But when we tell our story, tell it, you know, make sure it's the truth. And when you tell it, tell it to help someone else, to share your testimony, to help someone else. And, and, and that's, that's the thing about helping others is having enough heart of compassion and love to help others and to want to see the good and the best, the good in others and the best come out of the situation and to aspire to be better than you are and to live a more excellent, holy way. And so not just rebuilding marriages or rebuilding, you know, marriages, but rebuilding friendships. Restoring relationships, whether it's with a friend, you know, children, cousins, in-laws, whoever it may be, you know, and even people that, that might have been a disagreement in your past and you see them somewhere on social media, reach out to them, show them love, share some stories of good news, 
and hope, you know, like a picture, you know, something that lets them know that whatever happened in the past, the slate is wiped clean. How to rebuild a relationship after cheating. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean a partner. It can also mean someone violated you as a friend and you felt cheated. You felt violated. They violated your trust. But how to rebuild a relationship after cheating. And I hope that this video, you will share it and it will help someone in moving forward. God bless you all. May you have peace on today. And may God help you climb those hills or those mountains that you just kept trying to get up, but you just keep slipping and sliding back down. And may you stop digging and shoveling, but give it to Christ that he can help you out of that hole that you might have slipped in. God loves you all. Peace.